Today, I want to focus on a kind of different subject for my channel, how to tackle tricky subjects when painting. Specifically, I'll be painting this adorable black labradoodle named Booger and talking about the sorts of challenges that his owner and I had to plan around for his painting. And in turn, how I tackled those challenges both in taking the reference for the painting as well as the painting itself. I'm going to be going through quite a number of different points and ideas throughout this video. So if you have any questions, please comment as they come up. And if you encounter anything as I'm demonstrating here um, that's just really helpful or there's a concept that was really helpful to you, please let me know in the comments because I would love to hear from you. And um, same thing for giving this video a like. If you found it helpful, then it helps other people just like you find the same content. Okay, and with that being said, let's go ahead and dive in with the first challenge, which is that painting or even photographing dark colored animals is really tough. This was actually one of the first things my client brought up to me um, when we were planning this project, and it was just how difficult it is for her to get a good picture of Booger. His black coat means that not only does he usually just look kind of like this flat black silhouette in photos, it even happens in real life where if the lights are off, he can totally sneak up on you or just completely disappear. This told me before I even met him or was able to otherwise start planning the project that I 100% would have to take the photos in great lighting in order to get the shot that we need. Similarly, it would mean getting my camera settings dialed in um, and making sure that everything was just kind of in alignment to help produce the kind of photo we need. Um, with this kind of subject, one that's really tricky to capture visually, you really need all of your ducks in a row. As far as the photography details, though, uh, I knew that my best option here was going to be to shoot outdoors. Shooting outdoors would mean that I could maximize the amount of light that interacts with his coat, and as you can see, the effects are numerous, even as I'm blocking in this painting. There are a lot of colors here. Despite how tempting it might be to think of him as uniformly black, I knew that with the right lighting, we would have a lot of nuance to capture, and it was up to me to make sure that the reference and everything I was going to paint from would really showcase all of that. So for my photo shoot, I opted to take pictures of him um, not too early in the morning, but early enough that the sun wasn't totally overhead, and I picked a really nice clear day where the sun would feel bright. Um, and would shine differently on different parts of his coat. Um, specifically, if I had picked a day that just didn't have good weather, you know, that could definitely have implications that could keep me from getting a good reference regardless. You know, if I picked arbitrarily one day and it happened to rain and I tried to go through with the photo shoot anyway, maybe doing it inside or something like that, um, it would have been much more difficult to get the shot that I needed. Similarly, if I had picked like an overcast day, um, overcast lighting scenarios can be really beautiful to paint. I would totally look at any of Richard Schmidt's landscapes if you have any <laughs> doubt over that, um, because that is overwhelmingly how he prefers to work. Um, but it can produce really... I don't want to say it makes a flat painting, because that's not accurate, but it definitely wouldn't like bring out all of the different nuances of form here in Booger. I think it would have probably flattened him instead, metaphorically, of course. One other consideration was just time of day. I spoke to this a little bit just a moment ago, but basically picking a time of day that we think of as being sunny um, can often lead to like fairly uninteresting photos. Usually times of day when the light is going to create the most interesting image is going to be morning or evening. Um, 
that being said, I'm not a photographer. I know photographers feel really strongly about the best times of day to take pictures. Um, so take this with a grain of salt, I think is, is what I would say here. But um, I did want to be mindful of that as well. Once I was actually there for the shoot, though, um, I was also really careful to control the lighting scenarios. So I was very careful not to let him get backlit, for instance. While this worked out great for Millie in our previous painting video that you all should check out if you haven't already, I will link it in the upper right hand corner. Um, Millie's coat is so much lighter than Booger's that it really works for her to be backlit. Um, now with Booger, if he doesn't have the light shining on those parts of his coat, it's probably going to look maybe a little bit too dark or a little bit too flat. Once I got a photo of him where the lighting felt right, though, that's not really the end of the story. So I also do a lot of post-processing work to make sure that I boost the brightness of the shadows and the blacks up to be a little bit lighter without totally blowing out the light areas. Um, and I also up the vibrance so that we can see more of those colors reflecting off of his coat and into the sunlight. I know a lot of animal owners, regardless of what kind of animal, um, really like for their animals who have black colorings to look black. Um, sometimes when you introduce browns into the mix, you know, it can look as though maybe they're kind of sun bleached. Um, but what I find is even with like the purest black coat on any kind of animal, what's really beautiful about it is that it really can reflect all of these colors. What would happen if I treated an animal with a black coat, whether it's dog or a cat or a horse, um, as if there could be no other color or else it would suggest that like maybe they aren't properly groomed or something. Um, I think the natural sort of consequence of that would be to only paint the light areas like shades of gray. Um, and if you follow my work, um, you very well may do so because you like how colorful it is. And it wouldn't be hard to imagine just how like weird and out of place it would look if the subject weren't reflecting some other colors, at least subtly. So if I had just chosen to paint Booger as only shades of gray, um, we probably wouldn't have nearly as lively or beautiful or vibrant of a painting as we wind up with. All right, and that is it for challenge number one. Um, I am going to talk a little bit more about how I actually took the photos, but for now, I kind of want to take um, a little bit of a detour into another preparatory step and another challenge that came with it, which is that Booger's coat can mask a lot of his facial features. With animals with a long coat, it can be a real challenge to strike a balance between grooming that lets you see their face and their personality versus grooming that shows off their coat in its full glory. That was definitely the case here with Booger, as I could see that Booger had some beautiful photos of his coat when it was a little bit longer, but only the photos with him really freshly clipped could you see his face and appreciate the expression of his eyes and everything else. Now, different styles of grooming here could give off totally different vibes as well and show off different sides of his personality. So it wasn't just as simple as there being kind of this singular right answer as to which style really suited him. In the end, this was really a decision for the client. They know their pet and they know which look best reflects them and best flatters them. From there, it's my job to find the best way to work with that. Now, thankfully, in this case, that was not a challenge at all. Um, Booger was groomed such that his eyes were pretty visible no matter the pose. Um, and same thing with all of the other kind of key characteristics of his face. Nonetheless, I made it a priority when taking his picture to think first about whether or not I could really see his eyes. This meant that I could make little adjustments in the moment that could make the difference between a photo that would be perfect and one that just wasn't usable. 
Now, if I were doing a photo shoot of a dog who had a super duper long coat, I would probably approach it a little bit differently, but I would have the same goal. So maybe we could find a way to like physically pull um, the coat away from their eyes um, or maybe have like a helper kind of assisting with grooming in the moment to try and keep the hair out of their eyes between shots. Um, But either way, whenever this is in play, I'm really zeroed in as a photographer, I suppose, um, to the eyes and making sure that I don't get a shot that may be really compelling overall, only to find out that you can't see their expression because their eyes are totally hidden behind their fur. Okay, and now with all of the planning considerations out of the way, here's what it looked like for the actual photo shoot, Um, which brings me to challenge number three, which is um, Booger is just a super friendly dog and could make getting the perfect photo a challenge because he wanted to play with me the whole time um, rather than kind of looking aloof and like striking a regal pose. So with that in mind, here is what I have learned about photo shoots for dogs. One, and this goes back to what I've already mentioned, is to plan around their grooming schedule. So The photo shoot was scheduled for when Booger would have just come back from the groomer. Or for some dogs, maybe they look their best um, after, you know, their haircut has grown out a little bit. Um, There are a lot of considerations here, but basically I was not going to say, you know, let's try and make this work for this very specific day. Um, We were planning around a lot of things, including the seasons and when it made sense for him to get a haircut. So I made sure, for starters, um, to go ahead and wait until timing would be perfect so that he would look tip top. Number two is to pick a beautiful morning to take photos outside. Um, I have a note here to avoid days where it's just rained because at some point they will roll. Um, Ideally, you've gotten enough good shots by this point regardless, but it's still better if they're rolling in like dry grass versus wet mud. I could reiterate a lot of what I said at the start about lighting here, but basically everything I said before about capturing the perfect light and thus going out at the perfect time of day with good weather, that all applies here. Lesson number three that I have learned is to plan on at least 20 minutes of time for dogs just to hang out, smell you, um, make friends with you if they don't already know you, stop barking if they are nervous about you being um, in their territory, get pets, smell you, smell your camera equipment, and just get a little bit of playing out of their system. Um because I'm not here with like a sports telephoto lens to get action shots. I'm here with a portrait lens to get something that requires that they're maybe like a little bit calmer. Lesson number four is to have helpers who know the dog and can successfully get their attention. Um, In this case, you know, the dog's owner, the client, that's probably the best person for this. This was super helpful in Booger's case because most of the time he was looking away from the camera um, just because there was like exciting stuff happening in the yard or, um, you know, his playmate was out or the neighbor dogs were out or there was a squirrel (laughs) and I could call him and get his attention successfully, but I'd get maybe two shots before he would start running up to me um, because, you know, I was I was calling his name. Of course, he was going to come when I called. Um, but running up to me means probably kind of blurry motion shots rather than kind of nice posed still shots that I was looking for. And then past a certain point, he would run too close for my lens to actually successfully focus on him. Having a helper meant, well, it meant a couple different things. So I could use the helper in different ways. Um, They could potentially kind of hold the dog in place um, or maybe like talk to them and just kind of hold their attention. Um, They could pull their attention away from something else. Anything that I could do to kind of 
get their body and then their eyes um, in the positions that I wanted was super duper helpful. I'm sure you saw this in the previous video with Millie. Um, I had two different shots of reference. One was the original unedited photo, and then the second was the edited version that I actually used as my reference. In the original photo, um, you could see that someone was there kind of holding her steady. Um, not like she was about to run off, but it was just kind of to give her pets and encourage her to sit still. And then I could use a toy to get her attention, like prick her ears up and get her to look toward the camera. Even though I didn't need to use that for the specific photo that we wound up using for Booger, um, the same method applied. Because I had someone who could kind of keep him um, maybe a little bit more still in one place, and then I had like a toy that um, would encourage him to look toward me once he was kind of stationary in a given place and in a good pose with good light, um, I wound up having a lot of different options for us to choose from, which was great. And lesson number five, this is um, along those same lines, which is have good toys that make noise handy um, for all of the same reasons that I just mentioned. Anything that I could do to kind of get and maintain his attention was super duper helpful. Now, once all of these conditions are met, I would say the final thing that I've learned is to try and get Oh, goodness. Um, I wish there were a hard and fast rule for this number. I don't know that there is, but I wanted as many different really solid compositions as I could. So maybe there was one of like just Booger's face and profile that I loved, but I didn't know if the client wanted a shot in profile. Okay, so let's get one of him from straight on. Okay, what about one of him standing up? What about one of him lying down? Um, the more shots I could get like this, the better the chances of showing the client something that really matches up with what they had in mind. The result, I think, is that I probably had about 20 different options for us to choose from by the time I was sending potential references to the client for review. Um, and as a part of that, um, it's really helpful in the moment to like check your footage before you end the shoot. Make sure the shots you really like and we're planning on using are actually in focus and that everything genuinely looks good and correct and everything you think is usable is actually usable. Let's say you got the perfect shot of your subject like looking off into the distance at a three-quarter view and the lights hitting them just right um, but it turns out your camera wasn't in focus. You might not be able to recreate that shot exactly but you could probably take some extra time before you pack up everything and end the shoot um, to try and get some more shots at a three-quarter angle so that you can determine you know if that's like an option you want to explore or not. Okay that is all I have about the reference gathering part of this, um, which took up a surprising amount of this video. Let's talk about the painting and my final challenge, which is that curly coats like boogers can be really overwhelming to paint. My aim with this particular piece was to suggest the texture and the quality of boogers coat without getting too literal um, and getting kind of suckered into painting all of these um, little curly Q hairs. <laughs> um, after all, the idea here is to celebrate booger through the medium of oil paint. So we want the paint itself to enhance what we're seeing, not just reproduce it the way, um, the way a photograph would. And of course, with my style, I gravitate toward paintings that are loose while still accurately evoking the subject, which means this is a great opportunity to kind of illustrate to you what that looks like. So in Booker's case, I wind up thinking about his coat in a few different areas. Um, I have the area of his ears that catch the light and show the curl pattern very clearly. Areas around his muzzle that don't curl as much, but they do a great job showing variations in his coloring and how the light travels through his coat. Then last but not least, the coat on his body, which feels a lot more 
busy um, and easy to be overwhelmed by. Here there aren't any clear light and dark patterns. It just kind of reminds you of like static. There's a lot happening, but no one part of it is jumping out at you. Now, the coat around his muzzle is simple enough. Because it doesn't curl, I tackle it the way I did for Millie in the previous video. I'm really just focusing on shapes of color um, and don't need to get too concerned with the textural side of things. Now, next up is the area on the sides of his face that are catching light. These are the areas doing all of the heavy lifting for me, actually. If I do my job correctly and I tackle this well, you're going to get the sense overall that his coat is curly without me having to literally show that on every area of his body. Again here, I'm just trying to simplify tufts of curls rather than painting individual strands, um, but this is really where I show that curl pattern. And if I do this well, I'm really like 95% of the way there. One thing that I think is really important to note on this section before we talk about the next area is that here it makes more sense for me to have areas with hard edges. Because these strands or these curls are catching quite a bit of light and the curl pattern is so important, it makes sense to have harder edges here. Um, and I'm going to circle back to this when we talk about the body um, and kind of compare and contrast these two. And this leads me to his body. The texture here reminds me of static, like I said. A lot is happening. But unlike the highlights on the side of his face, nothing really stands out. Because this area feels tighter and busier, my aim is to stay soft without over blending. I want some dry brush here to suggest all of those coils and that texture without me having to actually paint a single piece of it. This also helps me a great deal in terms of not distracting from the focal point, which is his face. Now, to circle back to this idea of edges, when I'm painting his body, um, the way that I can really evoke this sense of softness is to really focus on having softer edges here. Now, as I already mentioned, I don't want to do this by over blending everything or else he's going to start to look like weird and plasticky and you're not really going to get that sense of really soft curly fur. Um, by using dry brush but trying to stay away from hard edges, I can kind of strike this balance between having his coat appear really soft and curly um, without it becoming distracting. As with every other painting that I've shown you here on my channel, my thought process from here is very straightforward. I'm thinking first in terms of the largest, most simplified versions of the shapes I see in the reference. And then as those get more and more accurate, I'm kind of whittling those shapes down to have more nuance and more intricacy. And that is it for this beautiful painting of a handsome Labradoodle that I had such a fun time meeting. If you found all of these tips and tricks on painting tricky subjects, um, and specifically tips for taking photos that you can paint from of dogs, um, I hope you'll give this video a like. I hope you will also subscribe and hit the notification bell because I would love to see you back in my next video. And until then, I hope you stay safe and wish you very happy painting.